Praise the Lord. What another great day in the neighborhood. God is so awesome. He's moving. He's doing some fantastic things. If you aren't seeing it, ask what he's doing. He'll, he'll tell you. Because there are good things going on. Yeah. Quit looking at the news, though. They aren't telling you anything good. They, uh, they like to keep you down and out and everything else, but God is actually doing some awesome things in this season. Well, I can't believe September is here and almost gone. <laughs> it seems like it's flying fast already. It just got here and it looked like it's going out. I'm thinking, man, somebody said on a prophecy a while back that the time will be speeded up, and it sure seems like it to me. So praise the Lord. Father, I just thank you for the time to get done that we need to get done. So we just give you glory, Father. He knows all the things that are going on, so we're in good shape. Again, I took this week and sitting on the edge of the bed, and I just felt I was supposed to go read the Word. And when I got through reading it, I said, Lord, I think I'm just going to do the same thing this time as I did last time, but this time you can take notes. <laughs> We're just not going to have the scripture up on top. We're going to have Debbie read it. And I might emphasize some of the things that the Lord was saying about it. But there's really a process that we're doing here that the Lord is speaking to us about. Last time was Ephesians 1. This time is Ephesians 2. This is the New Living Testament. Now the New Living Testament, as I said before, there's three different versions. Sorry to say. I must have the first version, which I like. The one that we have on the computer back there is the second, I think is the second version. It might be the third version, but it reads just a little bit different, but it means the same. So anyway, that's why I'm just having Debbie just read it directly out of the one version that I have. Made alive with Christ, Ephesians 2 and 1. Once you were dead, doomed forever because of your many sins. You, you used to live just like the rest of the world, full of sin, obeying Satan, the mighty prince of the power of the air. He is a spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passion and desires of our evil nature. We were born with an evil nature, and we were under God's anger, just like everyone else. Now, one thing you have to really realize... <coughs> It talks in there that we have an evil nature. We'll explain this a little bit more as we go along, but we have an evil nature. The reason we have an evil nature is because of the sin of our ancestors. When they sinned, there became a division between God and man. You have to realize that when God, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, there was no division. God walked with them. But then as soon as they sinned, he didn't come down and walk with them anymore. There was a division. They died. He says, if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. When he died, what happens? He then left the spirit of God that was in Adam, left Adam and went back home, back up to heaven. So he walked in a sinful nature from that point. So every time a person is born... Into this world, there is a sin, they get born into a sinful nature, according to the Word of God. We, according to that sinful nature that we had. Okay, go ahead. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loves us so very much, that even while we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's special favor that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ, and we are seated with him in heavenly realms, all because we are one with Christ Jesus. And so God can always point to us an example of the incredible wealth of his favor and kindness towards us, as shown in all he has done for us through Christ Jesus. God saved you by his special favor when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus 
so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. This is where I feel the body of Christ has really missed a lot of it. And that is because we're still walking in our sinful nature. We're still seeing ourselves as bad. We still beat ourselves up because of the thoughts that we have. We are going down through here. But see, we were dead. When you have a sinful nature, you are dead to God. So what did he did was he raised Christ from the dead, and through that, through God's special favor, you were saved when you accept Jesus Christ into your life. Immediately when you ask Jesus Christ into your life, you confess with your mouth and believe with, in your heart without doubt that Jesus is the Lord. Immediately the Spirit of God comes down and fills your heart. You now have a fullness. You are now alive in, in, in God through Christ Jesus, through the blood of Jesus. Now, through the blood of Jesus, you can enter into the throne room of God. We had a lady here a while back that was telling us we said something, and she came through the ceiling. Said, you can't enter into the throne room of God because a prophet told me that. You have to be very careful. Not everybody can go into the throne room. Only certain people can go into the throne room. That's why Ephesians 4 says you need apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teachers to perfect the saints for the working of the ministry, for the edifying of the body, till we all come in the knowledge and the fullness of Christ, not being tossed to and fro from every wind of doctrine. The winds of doctrines are out there. They're strong. That's why we have more people. That, and it comes down here, and it's talking about we are all one in Christ. When it says we're all one in Christ, how can that be? For years I sat back and many people would say, how can you be, how can it be? You know, God's supposed to be perfect, great, everything's supposed to be good, but how, how can that work when you've got 20 different people doing 20 different things, believing 20 different ways? How can that be? That makes sense. You talk to one person, they believe this way. You talk to another one, you believe this way. I just have a person that I know, and he's trying to convince me of his, his way of thinking. Sent me a video. I looked at it last night. He sent me two other videos prior to. And they come from the Calvinist background. And I really prayed, and I said, Lord, what, uh, what should I say? I don't want to come against the person. They're young, they're growing. And I said one thing. I haven't said it to him, but I'm going to. I was in a Dutch Reformed church for 30 years. And I learned a lot, biblically. But I never learned anything spiritually. They said, God isn't for today. The Spirit of God is not for today. Never heard one thing out of Acts 8, or Acts, the chapter, or Acts at all, the book of Acts during the whole time I was with the Dutch Reformed Church. What I heard last night was nothing more than what I heard for 30 years. Until finally I said, there's got to be more. There's got to be more. As soon as I said that, immediately I started to search for what there is. At that time I'd been through a divorce, lost my first son, the business that I was going to be with my dad. He had a partner. I was going to buy the partner out. And we we're going to go into business. John Deere called him up and took him over to, to Moline, Illinois, and said, we've got a guy who wants to buy your business. They didn't want to sell. He gave him a 10 time higher amount for the business, and the guy said, I'll take it. They came back with their tails between their legs, and it was just a bad and sad situation because of what happened. Guy wanted a, a business. He didn't care how he got it. He was a big, he was, had a lot of connections in John Deere and did that. But my dreams were shot. Everything was down. Divorce was on. Lost my first son. Terrible shape. And I started saying there's got to be more. There's got to be more. Until I met Debbie and we came up here to First Assembly of God and I was sitting in the a sanctuary and I'm thinking wow this is awesome there's something here that I've never felt before I've never had fun in church 
I always walked in, I sat down, I was quiet. You didn't want to make a noise, you didn't want to look at too many people. They might be staring at you, seeing what's wrong with you, and they might talk about you if you get through, if you mess up. I mean, it was just pretty much for the way religion is. That's the way I was for 30 years. But up here, they were fun and having, enjoying, and, and it, was, it was fun to be around. I said, I never had fun in church before. I said, there's something different than I've seen something over here, and I didn't know. It just, I just followed it with my eyes. I couldn't see anything. I just followed it. I said, I don't know what that is, but I need it. It was the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. I couldn't see it, but I knew it because I was seeking it. When I got baptized in the Holy Spirit the first time I opened the Bible, I understood the word like I never understood before. It's like, oh, is that what it means? Because the Holy Spirit is the one that gave the word, the understanding to the men that wrote it. He knew what it meant. The Holy Spirit knows the deep things of God, the inner parts of God. You get to know the Holy Ghost, you let the Holy Ghost move through you, you'll start to know who God is. You'll start to have it. And I used to have a relationship. I used to know of God. I did not have a relationship with God. The majority of the people have a relationship or a know of. Few have a relationship. Few have a relationship. But this is what he said in here. That because of our sins, he gave us life when we, uh, he raised Jesus from the dead. It is only by God's special favor that you have been saved. For the, He raised us from the dead along with Christ. We are no longer dead. We are alive. But yet Jesse Plantis today told us saying, I'm nothing but a dead man. He says, you can't embarrass a dead man. He says, I used to cuss out in the open. Why can't I speak in tongues out in the open? I said, whoa. It's a different thinking. That's not what this is talking about. He's not dead because he's alive in Christ. But he crucified his flesh. He killed his flesh so that he can walk in the Holy Spirit. He can walk with God. He can walk with God. And God can work through him. And he's not embarrassed of what God does or says or wants him to do. So there's a difference from being dead with a sin and being alive in Christ to being alive in Christ but dead to your fleshly desires and what you want and how you want to do. God also pointed out and showed us all that he had done. Or, yeah, sorry about that. God also pointed out and showed us all he's done for us through Jesus Christ. He wants us to have a better life. He wants us to go from there. He wants to have great things to happen. He planned this a long time ago. Go ahead and read the rest. Oneness and peace in Christ. Ephesians 2, 11. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders by birth. You were called the uncircumcised ones by the Jews, who were so proud of their circumcision, even though... It affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from God's people, Israel, and you did not know the promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope, but now you belong to Christ Jesus. Though you once were far away from God, now you have been brought near to him because of the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has made peace between us Jews and you Gentiles, Gentiles by making us all one people. He has broken down the walls of hostility that used to separate us. By his death, he ended the whole system of Jewish law that excluded the Gentiles. His purpose was, his purpose was to make peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new person from the two groups. Together, as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. He who has brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles, who were far away from him, and to us Jews who were near, 
now all of us, both Jews and Gentiles, may come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. See, I want to go along with this because this is where the whole problem has come down. And this is what the Lord's been dealing with me for some time to speak to people. And that is, the purpose was to make peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating himself one person from two groups. How can we have all these denominations? How can we all agree differently on different things? See, we come down and we start to say that. What did Jesus do? Wasn't it just for everybody? See, the division was between the Gentiles and the Jews. Jesus came down. He said to create himself as one person from the two groups. Together as one body. But if you start talking, just like I heard from that video, they're saying what they were actually talking about was the name it, claim it people. I don't believe in name it, claim it. I've been there, seen that, done that, went through it, doesn't work. I figured it out. It's wrong. There's a difference between name it, claim it, and believing and having faith in the word of God, standing on the word. Big difference. But again, there's a division. How did God bring that division together as one? We had a man came in here. He was a Jewish man. He was, well, he was actually a Methodist, I think, and found out he was Jew, and he, and he realized he was then a Messiah, or a Messianic Jew, because he believed in Christ. He came in here, and he started telling us that we needed to do this, and we needed to do that. He was going to Newton, and he was going to have and actual sacrifices of the temple. He's putting the tents up. He was going through the whole thing. I don't know if he's planning on having any sacrifices or not. I don't think so. But he was talking about the whole thing. And he said, Jews first, Gentiles next. And I started to talk to him about some of that stuff. And he was so stuck on what he was thinking. And I kept trying to work with him till finally I just said, said, no, we're not going to be involved anymore with anything that you're saying or doing because... All you're doing is causing division. Why? Because they were stuck in their own thinking. But how did Jesus create himself in one new person? And with two groups. So how do you take two people and make them one? How do you take two denominations and make them one? How do you take all of the religious sector out here that is coming against each other that are sitting there and making things happen what are they how are they bringing this together because see it even said in 16 together as one body christ reconciled both groups to god by means of his death and our hostilities towards each other was put to death but if you go to this church and they're going to tell you this is wrong this video that i'm seeing tells these other people are wrong how is it going to bring unity how are we coming as one jesus made he said he came to make one new person i said wow i've dealt with this a long time ago I worked with this a long time ago. But we got great division in the body of Christ today because we're still not coming to the place where we need to be. It's horrible. It's terrible. See, he brought us good news of peace to the Gentiles. But that didn't make the Jews happy. Jews are better than Gentiles. If you talk to people around the Jewish tradition, Gentiles are still second class. They can actually get mad if you say a Gentile has anything to do with a Jew. It, and when you get down through there, you start going through this. And how is it when, when somebody comes in and they said, the Holy Spirit is not for today. It was only for the disciples. When disciples died, they all died out. That's partially what I heard last night. Doctrines. He even went back and he went to Ephesians 4 and started talking about 
being carried away by every wind of doctrine. But yet he says we need to know the doctrines. Whose doctrine? And by what doctrine did you get it? I said, wow. This is amazing. Because he said that he was talking about the doctrine of the people that said, if you ask anything of God, you can get whatever you ask. He says, that's not right. You're right. It's not right. Because he left part of it out. It said, if you abide in me and I, my word abides in you, then you shall ask. The problem is, they don't abide in Christ. They're only thinking about what people are saying because they haven't died to themselves, to their understanding, to their doctrine, and started to ask the Holy Spirit to teach you the truth. I said, wow, this is something else. He also came in because there's a video before this video that I was, he sent, this young man sent me. And when he did that, he took, and, and this guy was standing there, and he, he even had a doctrine of, there is no carnal Christian, even though the Bible talks about it. Now, this last guy, last night that I listened to, talked about even the carnal Christians understand this, or don't understand it. I'm thinking, now this guy says, there is no carnal Christians. It's, it was a lie, and people have used that scripture to do it wrongly. This guy says, there is. What are you supposed to believe? Who are you supposed to believe? How are you supposed to believe? You've got to be trained up. That's why Jesus said you need an apostle, a prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher for the perfecting of the saints and the edifying of the body for the work of the ministry. Too many the fivefold have been doing all the work and the body of Christ is sitting in the pews and getting bored when they should be out doing what they're supposed to be doing. I said, whoa, this is interesting, Lord. Go ahead. A temple for the Lord. Ephesians 2 and 19. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. We are his house, built on the foundation of apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We who believe are carefully joined together becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also joined together as part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Praise the Lord. We who believe are carefully joined together, becoming a holy temple of the Lord. Even through him, you Gentiles are also joined together in part of the dwelling where God lives in his, by his spirit. That goes along with Genesis 3, I think it's 16. Don't you know that we are all the temple of the Holy Spirit? We are all the temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, in three days I'll tear this temple down and rebuild it. There used to be a temple where God resided on this earth. But there's no more physical temple that was destroyed. There's a spiritual temple. Those who accept Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in and fills them up. He joins us together. He joined us together, becoming a holy temple for the Holy Spirit. Here a while back, the Holy Spirit had me really strong. And before I go on that one, I'll say this. 17, verse 17 says, and I will destroy. King James says, or I will ruin. King James says, I will destroy any who destroy this temple. He says, I will ruin anyone who destroys this temple. And don't you know the Christians, you are the temple. When you start speaking bad about another denomination, oh, I thought Jesus up here said, uh, together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death, and our hostility towards each other was put to death. I'm sorry, 
it's alive and well in, in the world today. And until the body of Christ starts to realize that they're out of order, it will stay that way. They need to get in order with the Holy Spirit. They need to see the word of God and they need to get hooked up with the Holy Spirit so he can teach them the way the Lord and the, the word talks about. I didn't pray for 20 years saying I'm sick and tired of Christians losing the victory and not learn something. Because I said, Lord, not my will, but your will. What do you say? What are you doing? Right here it says it, right there. I said, Lord, what's going on? He says, uh, I said, I need to find out more. I need to realize. He's already showed me, already taught me. He confirmed exactly by his word because the first thing he said, he says, John 3:16. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son who so ever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Praise God we hear that all the time. Then he took and he went down. He took me to Isaiah 9 6. A child was born, a son was given, and the government was upon his shoulders. And upon this kingdom of peace there shall be no end. Kind of paraphrased that a little bit. It wasn't quite exactly how it's stated. But he brought forth a kingdom, a government, authority, a power. Jesus brought back the spirit of God on this earth. Jesus brought back the spirit of God on this earth. There's only one way you can unify everybody together in one body, and that's through the spirit of God. Only the Spirit can bring unity of teaching and understanding. Only the Spirit of God can bring you any unity in the doctrines that are out there in this world today. You say this doctrine's right, that doctrine's right, I'm going to tell you what, you better go ask Jesus and ask the Holy Spirit, is that right or not? You can come up with a great awesome thinking of how this is going to be, but you better be checking with the Holy Spirit to find out is it true. Religion has so been so bad, it's been run by men for so long. Men are being in charge because of what the word says. Women can't say anything. But, Galatians 3, I believe, says that we are all joined together through Christ. And if you're in Christ, you're in the Spirit. There is no male, there is no female, there is no Jew, there is no Greek, there is no slave, there is no bond. How can that be? Through the Spirit of God, you are one. Through the Spirit of God, you'll speak with love. Through the Spirit of God, you'll have no hostility towards one another. Through the Spirit of God, the love of God will fall in you and you will walk in a way you've never walked before. You will talk a way you never talked before. It is all about the heart issue. There is nothing that you can do if you do not have the love of God in your heart. I guarantee you, you might be the most powerful world man in the world. You might get as many people saved as you can get to save. You might have all kinds of things going on. People might be flocking to see you. But if you don't have love in your heart in God's eyes you're nothing but a tingling sound nothing I don't care what you achieve here on this earth I don't care what you've done you don't believe it go listen to Howard Pittman all the things that he did on this earth and he went to heaven he died and he said he wanted to come back to heaven and had God gave him an opportunity outside the gates of heaven and you can go back and read his testimony. He said he came over and it sounded like a wind. And he came down on top of him. He says, who do you think you are? Everything you did was for yourself. Everything you did was for yourself. I don't want to be that way. I want to take and hear what the Lord has to say. I've said some tough things to people and I don't like saying them, but I guarantee you when I say something, just know it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that I'm talking. It's not because I want to be that way. It's not because what's happening is, is right, wrong, or indifference. It's what I'm listening from the Holy Spirit. 
People don't like you when you do that. When you do it, you can get some results. That's why the devil is so powerful in this day and age. Because we aren't walking in the Spirit. We aren't talking to the Holy Spirit. We're only seeing what we like. We do what we like. And we continue in that way. It might get you to heaven. I'm not saying you're going to hell. But there might be things that you're missing. Through him, you Gentiles are also joined together as part of the dwelling where God lives by his Holy Spirit. God lives by his Holy Spirit. Do we live by his Holy Spirit? Do we really live by his Holy Spirit? Shane talked about fear and division. Because that is what's happening today. The fear and division. The COVID-19 is dividing people left and right. The fear that's going down through that. I don't get around somebody, I might get sick. The division and the fear of even the riots that are going on. It's one of the, and he also said fear and division are two big weapons that the enemy uses in his arsenal. Sorry to just say the devil used them very well. He's very strong. He's very good at it. Very good at it. I started to think about the season of our spiritual walk. Because I ran across the book that says, Growing Up Spiritually. I've had it for a long time, but I hadn't really read much of it. Uh, maybe I, if I did, I sure didn't remember it, but I knew a lot about what he said. It was kind of just reminded me, and I'm thinking, wow, it's some good things to understand. So I started to think about that season of our spiritual walk. The first season God watches over us and allows and answers all our prayers. When you first get saved, it's like it's easy being a Christian. You just pray and it happens. Things are good. You're excited. You want to go out and tell the whole world about what's going on. And the main Christians are, oh, calm down. Calm down. Don't get so wild. They should have said, get fired up and let's go. Instead of trying to put the fire out. Seen it happen. So that first season is when God watches over you in the spiritual understanding. When we give our Christ life to Christ, we're a babe. I've been in church a long time. But when I got a revelation of things, I'm still a, Christ, a babe you know, in Christ simply because I hadn't learned all the lessons. It takes a while to learn things. I thought I knew. I was wrong. So then, when you come to the second season, it's like a child. You try to stand up, walk, you fall over, hit yourself. You need somebody to watch and help you watch and stand up and walk and do things that needs to be done. I've watched many people in that season get lost. Because the first season was so fun, now all of a sudden it gets hard. And, and you, you pray and it doesn't work maybe as good as you used to. And, and you fall down and you hurt yourself and, and people talk bad about you and and you kind of get to feeling bad and the enemy starts stick, kicking up a little more enemy. And all of a sudden it's just like, wow. It just isn't, God doesn't love me anymore. And they left. I've heard that before. I said, wow, that's sad because that's when we lose a lot if we don't have people out there watching and working with them and keeping them going. Then we hit the third season is where you're growing, you start in, in class, you know, as, as you get older and as a, in the physical, you start to go to school, you start to learn how to do things. And then by the time you get to college, you should have learned everything that you know to do or high school and senior, you should have learned enough to when you get out on your own, you should be able to plant and then harvest what you plant. Live off of what you plant. That's by live off by your faith. Live with its understanding. If you're looking from the spiritual realm, in these seasons, the enemy can use these weapons of fear and division. One of the biggest things we've talked about. Other people have said it. You can watch it on the uh, oh, shows about it. That the lions are out there in the wilderness. Well, the, the best way he can get somebody out for a prayer, pray for food, is they get people separated from the pack. 
they have a pack of animals out here was a lion comes by and they they work on them and they get enough and they get you know they start to divide them they start to put fear in them instead of the animal going towards the pack they run off on their own and wow they surround them and boom it's done it's over that's what the devil does to us all the time it's done it's over he wipes us out that's his purpose the wild or the you know the lion or the adversary the devil walks around like a praying lion he wants to take us out it, it has techniques it has a way of getting you away from the pack I said wow but when you stay with a pack there's a better chance of them fighting off the lions they have help they see what's going on so they take what they've got and starts putting towards these lions and before they can chase the lions off I said wow this is amazing. I watched that on TV once in a while on the Animal Channel. Whoa, these guys are pretty strong too. Those you know, lions don't have a chance unless they get you out by yourself. So you have to be very careful and do what's going, watch what's going on there. It's pretty wild. Are you hearing about children that are committing suicide? Youth committing suicide. Because of having to be divided from people. Because of the fear. Because of the division of the coronavirus. There's more mental instability with people because of being locked up. Locked down. Think about that. The devil knows how to use the weapon. He's using a weapon right now. I'm going to the New Living Testament on, on Hebrews 10, 23, 25. So you want to read that, Deb? In having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that has promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Hey, you want to go to New Living Testament? That was King James. Yeah, that's King James. You want us to read that one? Yeah. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Yep. There it is. It says in King James on 25, not forsaken assembly of ourselves together. In 25 in the New Living Testament, it says, do not let us neglect our meeting together as some do. But encouraging and, and warn each other, especially now that the day of the coming back again is drawing nigh. I also like that because of the ways of the encouraging one another to uh, outburst of love and good deeds as it says in this uh, version of the New Living Testament that's what we're supposed to do is to encourage to lift up and bring people and help them get through the process and know what's going on you might not think uh, excuse me You might not think so, but you need each other to grow and mature in the Spirit of God. Amen. The devil knows this is, knows how to divide us in any way that he can. If you stay with a pack, more likely you won't get divided. If you have somebody that's starting, if they're having a hurt or a pain, you come and talk to somebody that you're around. 
so they can help you to get through that process. The enemy won't take you out. This is a serious thing to have happen in this season and it's so easy to draw people away. So many things can happen and the enemy just keeps pushing and pushing and that's why there's much going on that shouldn't be because we are being drawn apart. We have Dem and Louise from Merida, Mexico and they were on Tuesday night or Thursday night for Zoom and they were saying it is so hard down here because the only thing they have is Zoom they have not allowed them to go back to church and they said we got so many people you can't talk to anybody they're all just everybody gets on they have a song a word some songs words and then they're done they like the Zoom they said because we can talk to people we've got a communication but it's still not as good as being together and that's what's happening is, but this is what's going on. The enemy is using that very effectively. Very, very effectively. I'm going to go to Matthew 25, 1 through 13 on New Living Testament, please. You want to read that? The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps. But the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil, because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy the oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. Mm -hmm. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. Praise the Lord. I put that down there simply because I felt this is really a lot what's happening. The division that the enemy is trying, the fear that he's bringing in, is to stop people being ready to separate people, to keep people apart. And I took, and maybe you know, maybe you don't, what this is an illustration of what happened with the weddings back in the Jewish uh, tradition where the men, the fathers would come together and set up a dowel and they would patrol their son to their daughter and their daughter to the son and, and all that went through their but what happened was that they had a point where the, when that happened, the, the boy, the man, would then go be with the young lady and they would get to know each other, called a courting time. And they would spend some time to know who they are and what's going on. Then it, once that was over, the, the uh, father of the groom would say, come with me. And they would go back to his, their town where they came from and they would have the husband or this groom build a house prepared for his bride and and the groom could not go find his bride until the father says you're ready they might have the house ready everything looks like it's ready to go things are happening but they could not go and get the bride until everything was ready according to the father not what the, and the groom said. And then when that happened, the, the brides had to be ready. They had to have their bags packed. They had to be listening. Because the groom would come to the window and yell out for his bride. When the bride, knowing his voice, heard, she would come out to meet him. And then became the marriage. This is the same form. God sent Jesus to be on this earth. 
he got to know us. We got to know him through the word. We don't know him personally because we didn't walk with him. But he prepared, he, he got his bride ready. Everything we talk about is the bride of Christ. Everything what the word is about the bride of Christ. He says, I brought everything under unity under the spirit of God. And what happened was he went back to, you know, to heaven. What is he doing? And, and Revelation says, to build mansions. Same thing they did back then. And the physical, he's doing it in the spiritual. He's preparing a place for us. But he can't come back and get us until, until the Father says you're ready. Now I'm going to tell you one thing. Shane did not say this. I don't think he would have any problems with me saying it. I didn't ask him, but he didn't say not to say it. But he said he was with the Lord, and the Lord, he heard a vision, or heard from the Lord, saying to Jesus, the intercession is done. Intercession is done. Time to get your bride. Time to get your bride. I sat here and I'm thinking, Lord, according to the prophecies that I've seen and the prophecies I've heard was in my spirit, Last year, we had a prophecy from Ken, uh, Christmas, Kent Christmas that said, I'm done with lukewarm people. I'm done with them. Lukewarm. We've talked about lukewarm before. Have any questions, you can talk to us about it. Then he took. This year... He says a revival's coming, but has nothing to do with the lukewarm. He says it has to do with those who have not turned from me, have not come against me, but they didn't accept the stuff that was happening that was in the churches. He says, I'm going for a revival for those who have never rejected me. The lukewarm has rejected God. The lukewarm are not, they're just out doing their thing. They know of God. They don't know God. They're doing things with the word of God. They're doing things for this and for that. See, again, a lukewarm, if you want to talk about, was Howard Pittman. He was lukewarm. When he stood before God, what did he say? Everything you've done is because of what you wanted. It had nothing to do with me. He says, if you were to come, you wouldn't be here. You'd be in hell. We've seen the prophet. We've seen it. You can listen to it and go back and see it again. It's hard. People don't realize this stuff. And I don't think I finished my story a little bit earlier when I was saying that God said, John 3, 16, and then I went to, uh, yeah, 9, 6, Isaiah 9, 6. Sorry about that. I couldn't kick that one out. About his kingdom. He said he brought his kingdom what happened was when Jesus died on the cross, he then, when he went to heaven, sent forth the promise, which is the Spirit. The Spirit of God came down. That's how he brings unity, is by his Spirit. By becoming one in the Spirit of God. Not by believing a denomination. Not by believing a doctrine but by allowing the Holy Spirit to bring us into one person. Breaking down all the hatred and the bitterness. Breaking down all the divisions. Breaking down, I'm going to do this or going to do, if you do this, I'll help. Or if you, you know, I'm going to come and do this. Whatever it's going to be. I've seen this. That's why we went to the Capitol. I was there thinking, oh man, if they did this. Oh man, if they did that. Oh man. And then all of a sudden it hit me. They're talking about, Second Chronicles seven fourteen said, "If my people will humble themselves, I got there. They're not forcing a thing on me. They're not telling me I got to do this. I'm not telling me they're not controlling anything." It was even last Sunday when we we're up there. He said, "I was listening in the spirit. There's one person here that we got to pray for." And it was not about him. It's not about a denomination. It's not about an understanding. It's about the Holy Spirit. 
And I had to sit back and I had to say, Lord, I have to humble myself. Humble means submit yourself under another. Because they're not forcing anything on me, I will submit myself under. And we go in and we start praying and we're going to start to see some tremendous results from the prayers and what's going on. Why? We're one in the spirit. We have no agenda. We have no desire. We have no need of this or need of that. We just go and be in unity of the spirit. The oneness of the spirit will change things around because God can move in the oneness of the spirit. But when we're in a division, when we're complaining about this church and complaining about that church, when we're saying they need to change and they need to change, no, that's God's problem. I'm not God. God can change them. I'm just telling you one thing. I'm going to be locked in the spirit. When the Lord wants me to do something, I'll do it. And when he doesn't want me to do it, I won't do it. You know, it's just like Jesse. I never really thought too much about it. I'm a dead man. I crucified my flesh, and now I'm going to do what God wants me to do. So if I'm a dead man with Jesus, even though I'm alive in Christ with Jesus, I'm still dead with Jesus, what happens was, praying the Holy Ghost in, in, in public, talk to people in the public. You don't worry about it because you're already dead. How can a dead man be, in, <laughs> be embarrassed when he said that? That struck me. <laughs> How can a dead man be embarrassed? <laughs> if you're truly dead and you don't care about your flesh or what's going on, and if you do it with love and of the Holy Spirit, you're going to be surprised what's, hap what's happening. But I took and I said, Lord, I'm looking at this, and I'm looking at the division. I'm looking at the fear. I said, what is going on? And he said, the devil's trying to steal your oil. He's trying to drain your oil. He's trying to stop your oil. What is the oil? The relationship through the Holy Spirit that you have. The unity of the Holy Spirit. The oneness of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to play a video I played before. It was one that I had seen. And when I was thinking about this, the devil's there to steal your oil. I said, wow. This is something that's going on because he even said before that the circumcision was only physical. But God, through the Holy Spirit, did one thing. And that was, he does a heart thing. It's what's in your heart. It's all about heart. Everything you do when you stand before the Lord, you're going to see what's in your heart. How is your heart? It's all about your heart because his commandment is, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and thy mind. And the second, love thy neighbor as thyself. If you don't love yourself, you got too much in there. Ezekiel 34 says one thing. We'll be into the shepherds because you go out and you eat and you use your sheep but you, and you close yourself, but you never take the hurts and the pains. You never get the junk out of the heart. When we're talking about in uh, Jehoshaphat and Kings, when he's talking about he did the, the ways of the Lord, he did everything according to his father Asia, Asa that lined up with God, pleasing with God, did everything with God, but... He never took the high places out of the people. The high places were when they had a problem and they kind of fell away from God. They would go up on the high place and they'd create an altar and they would do a sacrifice or they would sin, as you would say. That's the problem. The body of Christ doesn't always get that out of their heart. They sit there and they wander and they squander because the shepherds aren't there to do it. The shepherds aren't doing what they're supposed to do. I just want to play this video again. October the 2nd, I had a dream. And my spirit left my body. It was like I was in my apartment and my spirit got pulled out of my body. And I would go in these different transits. Um, bright color lights. It was white. She like The best way I can explain it would be shoo, shoo, shoo. All the different flashing lights and I appear before a blue sky with no clouds 
uh, it was like a blue place. No land, no trees, no grass, no water, nothing. There was nothing there but a blue atmosphere. And I would see this atmosphere goes millions of miles upon millions of miles where nothing existed. It was like nothing was hidden. Everything was revealed. Everything was before your eyes. You could see it. And we was in this clear kind of body form, some form of light as a, you would refer to a soul or a spirit or, or and, and I could see through, it was so transparent and in front of me was thousands among thousands similar to what I was and thousands among thousands behind me. And, and I knew that it was some form of a soul. And in the middle of my chest were seeds, multiple seeds. I didn't know what they were for. And I realized that I was the only being that could actually move out of my place and look and observe, smell, taste, you know, feel. All my senses were active at this point. And so, you know, um, I began to look around and, and to observe the things that I saw, not knowing that this was a dream. I thought this was reality. I thought this was actually happening, you know. Um, and I look forward and there was this great shadow way in front of me, way at the end of the line. It was like thousands and thousands of people in front of me. And there was a shadow, a great big shadow, but it had no detail. It was like a, as a vapor. And I could, I could see that it was a shadow of something that was in the front. And, um, I, you know, I had many questions at this point in this dream. And out of nowhere, I, I, hear, I heard these words. Depart from me And this galaxy This portal I don't know what to call it On the on, on the right side of, of God You know uh, Or Jesus Christ You know Whoever you, you, you decide to identify That spot of judgment On the right side of him There was this big portal That opened up And There will be stones of fire and Normally when you, you, you You get a lighter And you cut it on Try to um, Spark a flame but instead of fire, it was stones. And they will leak out of this portal. And whoever whoever that guy said, the puff me flew down this place. And it the flame, the, the stones were so hot that it would burn everybody outside of that portal. On the left side of our, our body or our form, it would burn us. And it would, everybody would be like, ooh. Like as if it was so cold or so hot, you would tell somebody to close that door. It's too cold. That's how hot it was, and the the portal closed, and then the he he sent them so fast that the screams were late. I would hear ah like it was like the part for me, and it closed up. Then the screams come ah, and it terrified me. And then out of nowhere, something snatched us up, and like we moved up the line, and I began to think I I didn't understand where we was. I'm like oh my god. Maybe this is judgment. Yeah, my, you know, I had many questions and I would hear, depart me, depart me, depart me, and all these different people will be sent to hell. And the part that scared me the most was the people that were getting judged, you could hear when God was talking to them. And you could hear everything they got judged from. So if somebody went to hell for something that you knew you struggled with in your life, you knew where you were going. And so I'm just saying people go, shoot, sit to hell, boo, boo. But I'm seeing the flame and it's just constantly burning everybody outside that haven't been judged yet. And I could hear some of the people um, talking to God. And um, I remember there was a woman, you know, blonde hair. And God was talking to her. He said, I'm not judging you for what you put on Facebook. But I'm judging you on how everybody else received it. 300,000 people were led astray by one of her Facebook posts. And he said their blood was on her hands. And I don't know what he said, the ball for me. And I'm talking about, I couldn't express how powerful his words were. It's as if he said, the ball for me and everything shook. And she was like, she was sitting with great force. And the port opened up, boom, she was going to fly, and it would close, and like, ah, 
entire screen was so late. It terrified me. People, uh, adultery, uh, 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 fornication, of uh, so many different things that I could actually hear. And people in front of me were terrified because a, a lot of those people were struggling or went through the same situation and they never repented. So I, thousand, one thousand, sent here, sent here. They would go, they were flying, my door was flying so fast. I've never seen something so fast. And it got to the point where I was next in line. And he called me up. And he started talking to me. And keep in mind that our life held, held us hand in hand. So anything we did in our life, our, our life testified against us. So you couldn't lie because your life testified. Say, yes, you did. You did this. You did this at this time. Yes, you did. And whenever God would speak to me, you would see a big screen. Like you would see as if whatever God says, it comes to life. And so um, he started talking to me and he started telling me everything that I could have did better. And and at this point, you know, I'm like, okay, God, you know, I could do this better. I did it. You know, I did okay with it. But I could have did better. So he began to say other things and he brought up this specific woman. And he asked me, why didn't I forgive her? And he gave me her specific name. I'm not going to say it. He gave me her specific name. And I knew exactly what he was talking about. He asked me, why didn't I forgive her? I said, I did, God. I did forgive her. He said, well, uh, if you forgave her, when you get on the phone and talk to her, why is it that you treat her like the situation happened all over again? And... I'm like, God, but I, I did forgive her. He said, well, if you forgave her, why are those seeds still in your chest? And I looked down. I was like, oh, my God. That's what those are for. Those are seeds of what I did in my life. The things I didn't forgive. So he was talking to me, and I was like, oh, my God. And he told me. He looked at me and said, because you didn't forgive her, I didn't forgive you some of your sins. And I was like, oh, my God. And he started telling me so many other things, and he ain't told me not one good thing yet. And at this point, I'm getting terrified because my mind is starting now going to a place where I'm imagining how hot this this fire is gonna be when this portal open. And so, you know, I'm, I'm scared. I, I didn't know how to explain how terrified I was. I, words can describe. When you meet God, faith words can describe how terrifying it is to look your Creator face to face. Where we're there, there's nothing hid from him. There's nothing. Your inner thoughts are revealed before him. Your your how your your perception, how you feel, everything that host you hosted in this body is presented before him. And so you know, he, I got to a point where I, I just I like I didn't want to hear God no more. I was really turning my head because I was afraid that you know, it's already made his mind up. <laughs> I was so afraid, and so I turned my head and. He would just come to tell me everything that I didn't do right or, or I could should I should have did better. And at this point, I knew I was going to hell. I knew it. I, I, I was fully persuaded that this was it. So I turned my head and I was like, I don't want to hurt no more. But you know, my mind, I'm just, I'm just, I don't, I don't hear. I'm just really trying to imagine how hot hell is going to be. I'm like, oh my God, Lord, I have no more chance. If I go down there, I can't come back. Like, Lord, please don't send me to hell. Please, like, God, please. I'm begging you. And I'm, I, I'm more terrified. Ter I was more terrified than I can express. And so I turned my head, and, and at this point, I no longer wanted to hear what he had to say because I knew at this point, you know, I, I was going to hell. And I would have my head turned, and I don't know where there was this warm feeling that would come over the, the interface of my soul. And I would turn my head, it would go in slow motion, and the tears would fly from my face. And I looked at God, and I was looking at his, his judgment, what, what, what was going to be my judgment? And he looked at me, he said, face to face, you don't get it well done. You get it, you barely made it. And he stepped back and said, come. And at this point, I was so confused. I'm like, oh my God. And on his left side of God, heaven would open up so soft with brilliant lights. Uh, the colors were indescribable. Like colors I've never seen before in my life. It was so, 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 so pretty, so amazing. And the colors would blossom as they grow, and as they grew and the heaven would open up so gentle. 
and I would walk toward that direction and my hand would go in the portal and when my hand went through, it got bigger. My arm went through, it got bigger. It was like I was growing into a, a, a mature state of a glorified body. And so my leg went through and I got bigger and you can see how big I got on the other side and, and how my soul was being transformed into a glorified body. And my body would go through it and, and only piece that was left behind was my leg and right before my last foot got in, um, I woke up. The dream scared me so bad. I was underneath our living room table for hours. I was so terrified. I was terrified to move. I was terrified to do anything because I was afraid it was going to be added to my judgment. I thought that was the judgment. I, that didn't feel like a dream. I could feel, I could taste, I could tell you how it made me feel. Everything was so alive in the dream. And at that moment, I was asking God, like, God, why did you give me this dream? He said, because I want you to warn my people that the things which you saw are the things that shall be. And I didn't realize. That Makes you think. How's your oil? If you're waiting for the Lord, you got enough oil in case he goes past the midnight hour and you have to do, or you have to go back and get some more oil. It's your relationship with God. It's it's praising and seeking and coming to know and understanding what the Lord wants you to do. I also went on to where do you get your oil? And that's first John three. 1 through 10, if you want to read that one, New Living Testament. See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure, just as he is pure. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law, for all sin is contrary to the law of God. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins, and there is no sin in him. Anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. But anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. Dear children, let, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. Okay, hold on there. The thing is, when he said that he had, a, he had forgiven somebody, but yet Jesus or God said, why did you not act like you forgave him. You still hold resentment. You still kind of think, oh man, these people are rotten. Don't want to be around them. Whatever you, the hurts and pains you've had, whatever's happened through you. But if you go back to the love chapter and you go through love is kind. Love is patience. And you get there and it says, Love holds no wrong. What he was saying was he didn't have the love of God. He didn't have enough love to release that person from the offense. You're walking too close in the spirit or in the flesh than you are in the spirit when that happens. That's just the truth. I'd rather tell you here than have you get to heaven and have God tell you. I'd rather have you learn it now than it's getting to heaven and finding out like what he said. The fact is, so many people do not release people after they forgive them. God does. Every time you ask forgiveness, you're forgiven. There is no residue whatsoever on that. Also, Wednesday night we start talking very strongly and it's talked about righteous or holy. I says, how, I said, do you believe that you are holy? 
Can you call yourself, I'm holy? Can you say, I'm holy? Can you look in the mirror at yourself and say, man, I'm holy. I'm holy. Not pridefully, but confidently. Knowing who you are in Christ Jesus. Or do you look at yourself in the mirror and say, oh man, God can't use me. I'm really a bag of, a sack of bad things. I got too much baggage with me. I sinned too much this week. I caused too much problems. God can never use me. Is that what you say about yourself? Is that what's going on? And we talked about that. How do you realize that you are holy? How can God call you holy? The only thing I knew about holy people was when the Catholics had their saints. Holy saint this and holy saint that. All kinds of holiness. You had to be a saint. You had to live a good life and die and then they worshipped you. That's all I knew when I grew up. I, that's not it. It says right in here. Those who sin oppose the law of God. For all who sin oppose the law of God. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins, for there is no sin in him. So if you continue to live in him, you won't sin either. Now, you got to look at the whole word. It also says, we all fall short of the glory of God. Because God says that there's a war going between your flesh and your spirit. Your flesh wars against your spirit. We have a sinful body. We are no longer a sinful creation or nature like we used to be before Christ came in us because we became a new creation. All old things were passed away. We no longer are sinful by nature. I, it took me a long time to get a hold of this. I even taught one time. Oh, I'm, I'm no better than a man in the, the ditch that's drunk in the alley and all that stuff. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. God corrected me on that. But my son died. And I sent my spirit down. And you accepted me. You no longer are a sinner just saved by grace. You're a new creation. You are a new creation. You are a new creation. Yes. Are you perfect? No. You are trying to achieve and grow to that place to where you are. But the more the Holy Spirit is in you, the less sinning you want to do. The more the Holy Spirit comes in you, the less sinning you want to do. The more you see God, the more you understand God, the more you seek God, the more you realize when you sin that's how bad it was and you start to feel bad about it. You get your conscience back. And you start to see things and you're willing because you know that all you have to do is cry out to Christ and say, forgive me. <laughs> Boom, you're a new right back in, in shape with, with Jesus. With God Almighty. Walking around holy without sin. How can that be? I just sinned. God said he'll forgive you. That's what Jesus came to do. Forgive our sins. Well, all we have to do is allow it to happen. But so many times we oppose the law of God and we don't agree and we keep calling ourselves nasty and bad and cruel. You're coming against, you're actually sinning against God's, what he did to you. You're coming against what God did to you. He gave you his son. He gave you the spirit of God, the promise of God that came down that made you one with him. You go back to Ephesians. One God, one spirit, one baptism. One Father, one Jesus, one body. How can you all be that way? Only if you're walking, living, and breathing, and using the Holy Spirit. Denominations don't do that. Doctrine does not do that. They pick, they choose, they do what they want to do. Only the Holy Spirit can teach you and show you and raise you up. And I guarantee you what? When you realize that you are a new person, it's not because you can do anything. It says, dear children, don't, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do 
what is right is because they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. You're righteous as dirty rags. How can that happen? Because Christ gave you his righteousness. If you don't have an understanding, if the Holy Spirit can't give you the ability that he gave you his righteousness, we no longer walk in our sinful nature by being in the flesh. We come over in the Spirit and receive the Holy Spirit to make us one with Christ using Christ's righteousness. When you look in the mirror, you say, I'm holy, I'm righteous. Only by the grace of God can we say we're holy and we're righteous. But the devil wants us divided over here in the flesh. Oh, I'm not good. I'll never do anything. God can't love me. I've been there. I've done that. For years I've done that. Kept me divided, kept me down, kept me to the point where I didn't understand who I was in Christ Jesus until I got the revelation. The Holy Spirit came down. <clears throat> he now put into me a holy righteousness of Christ in me where I can walk and talk and be with the Holy Spirit. I can be as Christ desires to me. He made me. He wants me. He has a desire for me. He has a purpose for me. He has a plan for me. And now I can do it. Why? Because I got things out of my heart. I love people. I love the Lord. I walk in the love of God in my heart. You don't get it in your heart, you'll have seeds yet. You don't realize that you are righteous in God's eyes. You are holy in God's eyes. Physically, no. Your neighbor, your spouse might say, no. But a holy God says he is, she is. A holy God said my children are holy and righteous because I made them holy. I made them righteous. I made them holy. I made them righteous. Don't deny what God has done for you. Don't allow the Spirit to steal that from you. You don't think you can do anything. God gave you a gift. And he's not repentant for the gift that he gave you. Because he knows you can do it. The devil just gave you enough information to let you know you can't do it. Because you're never given enough time for God to show you that you can do it. He's divided you from what you're supposed to do. There are people sitting out here going to hell because you refuse to get in and do what you're supposed to do. I'm not putting in a guilt trip on you. I'm saying, Lord, convict them if they're supposed to be doing something and they're not doing it. And the devil's pushing them and doing this and doing that and doing everything else and not going the way they, you want them to go. Then, Father, teach them, show them, and train them. Have mercy upon them. As I said, I'm not coming against anybody. I'm not con condemning. If I'm condemning, then I apologize because it's coming from the devil and I don't want to come from the devil. Father, you have an anointing to fall in this place. And, Father, I'm just going to release it right now. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, you have said... This place was set up to do one thing, and that was to train people up to who they are in Christ, to put them in a position and allow places for them to go and to do as you desire to call them into those places. And, Father, it's been hard. It's been tough. And I'm asking right now for a completion and the people that will come in that will help to achieve this goal that you have set up. I just found out last week as I had a dream many years ago. And the dream was about how I was going out in, into different fields and different places and we were taking a team and we would go in and we would get a, people fired up for the Lord where they didn't have any hope. They were all divided. They didn't have any understanding. We would go in as they called us and they would get the fire of God there and they would start to go and they would start to produce. And we would leave We'd stay there maybe two, three weeks and just get them fired up. Not have revival meetings, that's part of it, but more about getting the people on fire, changing their lives, 
developing them, bringing them to the place where they need to be, leaving. Month later, checking with them, then going back and refiring them and keep them going. Because when you get somebody fired up and you don't have somebody to keep them going, they'll die out. And then all of a sudden we had so many people calling us we couldn't go and there was a place that we were supposed to go. We start telling them, come to us. And people start coming. And we start having week meetings or more. And there was one day I was standing in this hallway. And as I was standing in the hallway, I just got through with a meeting that we had. And everybody had just left. I was standing in the hallway by the door and a janitor was there and I said, Lord, I told the janitor, I says, we just got through with the meeting. You can go in and clean that room. And he looked at the wall and he says, there's no door. And I knew at that time it was a God's vision. And he told me this week, and I says, I don't understand. We're sitting here. We're less people than we've ever been. We still have people. A lot of them are just being pulled away doing different things. And I said, Lord, what's going on? This is unbelievable. We're going to buy the building. You have been keeping this building going. This is your ministry. This is what you want. It didn't look like there was any way we'd get a loan to make up for the contract that we have to pay off because of the balloon payment. I says, Lord, if you want it, it's yours. You're going to have to bring it forth. He brought it forth. Within about three weeks, we should be able to purchase this building. Praise the Lord. It's, it's, it's God's hands. And he said, this is exactly what I showed you in the vision. You're building this church up to go out and do that. And I said, God, we're going to have to have people to do it because I can't do it on my own. We have to people come in and fill positions and start to do the things that they're called to do. So you're going to have to start to bring them in. You're going to start to have put a desire in their hearts to start to stand strong with you in order to do what we're called to do. It is going to be. A dedication to God to do exactly what you want to do. And to be obedient and to be humble in ourselves under another. To just allow things to happen. As well as being one and knowing who we are in Christ Jesus. Which is the righteousness of Christ. With a love in our hearts. To do what you want to do. I release that upon this place. I thank you Father. Help me to proceed as, as you desire me to do. I know there's a lot of distractions that I have, Father. Help me to focus in on exactly what you need to do and achieve what we need in this season to bring it to pass. Father, I thank you for the definition that you have shown me about mercy. Mercy is the aspect of God's love that changes or causes him to help the miserable. The aspect of God's love that helps him, that causes him to help the miserable. Just as grace is the aspect of his love that moves him to forgive the guilty. Mercy is the aspect of God's love that causes him to help the miserable. Those who are miserable may be so either because of breaking God's law or because of circumstances beyond their control. Situations that keep them from doing what God wants them to do. Some are just rebellious. Father, I come before you. I pray the mercy is great upon each and every person this day. But I pray the, great, the more they grow in the Lord, the less mercy they need. Because they'll be doing the will of the Lord. They'll be doing what you're doing. But I just ask, Father, that each person in this room, everybody that be watching this will understand they need to be filled up with the Holy Spirit. They need to accept the promise of God. They need to find out why and understand Jesus sent, or God sent his son Jesus to this earth to set up a kingdom. The kingdom is all nothing but spirit. The Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, he released it upon us, lives in us. And as we start to rely upon the Spirit, not our doctrines, not our understandings of past ministries, not what's going on, when you hear something, take it before the Lord, and the Spirit of God will teach you and show you if it's right or wrong. 
It is time to bring forth and fill up our jars with oil in such a way to where overflow and touch other people and fill them up. So when the time does come and the bridegroom comes, we all will have enough oil and none will be left. Because it's said in there that when he comes back and he hears the knock, he says, get away for I knew you not. There was no relationship. There was no true understanding. Many will be lukewarm. He says, I will spit them out of my mouth. Many stand before Jesus and say, I've done all these things. And he will say, get away from me because I knew you not because they never had a relationship. They never got filled with the Holy Spirit. They never knew. They talked good talks. They learned good things. There are a few people that will go to heaven even if they don't have the Holy Spirit because they've accepted Christ and they've done the best they can do without the Holy Spirit. Only God knows who will go. I'm not saying just because you don't have the Holy Spirit you're not going to go. That does not say that in the Bible. All it says is it gives you power and endues you with power to do the things that gives you the authority and power over the demonic spirits. So here completely, just because you don't have the Holy Spirit doesn't mean you're not going to go, but you're missing out a lot on this earth. And you'll see that when you get to heaven. God made us one through his Holy Spirit. Don't reject it. Receive it. Father, we come before you and we thank you for this blessed day. We thank you for this word. We ask, Lord, that none will be lost, that all will be saved, and that you will help us, guide us, direct us, and bring us through this time period, this season, to achieve and to do all that you want us to do. Bless each every person. Keep them safe until we meet again. In the name of Jesus, amen.